check. I think you can hear me now. Hopefully. way over there so I don't knock it over okay very good well we're gonna go ahead and get started talking about the enlightenment today um, so hopefully you've been continuing doing some self-studying at home if you're still planning on taking the AP exam I want to thank you I know that a handful of kids have um, have dropped the test, but I appreciate if it's disappointing because I feel like um, I definitely think that the test, they deliberately made it too easy to prevent people from dropping. And so it's sad that with all the changes that they made to the test, I feel like a lot of that work kind of goes maybe not totally. Um, I don't know, it just kind of feels like a little bit like a loss, but then I guess a lot of this whole situation has. So anyway, I appreciate, I appreciate that you guys take the time to tune into these as I am taking the time to do them. Um, let's, I guess I'll start by um, pulling up that same thing that I had pulled up the other day. Okay, do that. And we'll jump over here to this. All right. So, um, last time we talked about scientific revolution. And the scientific revolution definitely contributes to the Enlightenment. In fact, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, as I always say. Um, remember that what what fundamentally what the um, what the scientific revolution was trying to do or was beginning to do was to explain global phenomena. Uh, in a way that um, makes sense. Uh, maybe that's not the best way of saying it, but basically trying to to understand how the world works through uncovering uh, known unchanging laws about the universe. Okay, that's... That's the idea behind the, the scientific revolution is that everything it, it, it's it's um, it's the idea that pretty much everything, maybe not everything, but a good amount of things that happen can be explained through uh, science. OK, maybe not everything, but a good a good number of things can be explained through through science and the scientific revolution was trying to make the world a, in some sense a less unpredictable place and a more predictable place uh, by by coming up with laws of nature essentially and the enlightenment takes that from the physical sciences of at the time in particular astronomy physics um, less so chemistry until later. Chemistry is more of a recent thing. Not not like as recent as well. Ke I mean, chemistry obviously plays a big role in um, in medicine as well. But like when we think chemistry and medicine, I would rather have you think about like the 1900s, the the 18th, the 1800s and 1900s, or the 19th and 20th century. Uh, rather than the scientific revolution which you should be thinking like 15 and 1600s for scientific revolution so scientific revolution is more about physics more about astronomy and the enlightenment tries to take those same kinds of principles that that the world can be explained through known unchanging laws um, and applies it to humankind 
there's this idea that natural science and reason can explain essentially all aspects of life. And this is one of the tragic flaws of the European character in some sense is that they, after the Enlightenment, they, th they start to think of themselves as, as these flawlessly rational people. Um, and of course, uh, they're not. But there's a lot of faith in reason at this time. There's a lot of faith in reason. There's a faith in the idea that everything can be explained through reason. And um, the Enlightenment is this movement that, of course, originates, I think, probably, you know, well, if you really want to talk about the, origin the origins of the Enlightenment, of course it originates with the Renaissance in some sense because all of the ideas that are being espoused during the Enlightenment are their their ideas that were inspired by all of the works that were uncovered after a thousand years or so uh, at the during the Renaissance, where where they're looking back at ancient Greco-Roman antiquity, and famously, of course, the Greeks and the Romans used uh, an ancient form of government called democracy that hadn't been used in Europe for a long time. And the Renaissance is this rebirth of all of these uh, ancient art, architectural, literary, but also political and other histories. And Europeans start to take a look at the circumstances governing European society at that time and realize like, wow, uh, it seems that the way that we're governing um, may not, may not um, be most conducive to uh, how people operate. So if we talk about the Enlightenment, it's really looking a lot at humans and how they behave and how they interact with one another in large groups. And, and, the, and the Enlightenment pertains to how humans ought to uh, express fundamental aspects of Enlightenment philosoph principles like liberty, or how do humans express equality? Or how do humans express uh, crime and punishment? Or perhaps maybe not express, but define crime and punishment. Um, the practices behind how government should work. All of these are sorts of ideas that start to be questioned during the Enlightenment. Now, of course, originally, a lot of the Enlightenment philosophers had no intention of trying to put into place some sort of uh, democratic style government by any stretch of the imagination. Most of these guys wanted reform from the top down, but um, of, it, it goes without saying that the Enlightenment as, a, as an intellectual movement single-handedly pushed, uh, pushed, you know, governments in Europe, but also really it started here in America, towards a democratic republic. Now, the extent to which these republics are truly universally democratic is, is up for debate. When they first start introducing republican-style governments in first America and then in France after the French Revolution, um, they're pretty radical and they are not super democratic. And in particular, in France, the 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 style of Republican government is viewed as extraordinarily radical. Here it's radical too. Um, it's less violent though. And so in France, when they, when they, under the Robespierre years, where they go to the style of, of uh, Republican government, it, it gets ugly for a while there. So let's talk about some of the beliefs that were put forth during the Enlightenment. Key terms to associate with the Enlightenment. Liberty, for sure. Liberty is a big one. Not so much equality. Not so much equality. Those two terms, in some sense, I, I learned one time years ago. I learned this in college one time. A professor said this, and I've, it's always stuck with me because I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. In order for a culture to embrace liberty, it must sacrifice equality. And in order for a culture to embrace equality, it must sacrifice liberty. And that any combination of those two terms are, of, uh, in some sense, in opposition to one another. It's a sliding scale. 
Okay, so maybe you're 70% uh, free and only 30% equal. Um, I guess maybe the ideal balancing point then would be you're kind of half free but half equal. I don't know if that's right or not. Um, but it's true. It seems that whenever a, whenever a culture wholeheartedly embraces, say, liberty as a, as a cultural norm, which I would say the United States very much values liberty as a cultural norm, uh, that comes along with it some degree of sacrifice and equality. Now, the one area, if we're talking economically at least, which is what I was talking about, the one area in which we can hope that or at least aspire to uh, institute equality is equality under the law, meaning that while people are not equal economically, ostensibly they should be equal in law because the law is the law and the law should not be arbitrary in terms of how it is conducted. And so the law should thus apply equally to everyone. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case. To be clear, I think that we could point to a number of times where just in the last 10 years, the justice system here and in other places has failed people. Okay, it happens all the time. You hear stories all the time in the news about folks who, um, not to say it's, um, not to say it happens with every case. There are times where the justice system does a great job, but but there are also times where it doesn't and there are, there are a lot of startling statistics about crime in the united states and prejudicial factors in the judicial system and other things like that that result in some people being executed for crimes and then other people not then there's stories about wealthy folks who have managed to hire some of the most talented teams of attorneys to be able to, um, you know, uh, skirt the law. So ideally, the Enlightenment philosophers would say equality is a principle insofar as it, op it applies to equality under the law. They certainly did not believe in equality of society, though, to be honest with you. That was not something... Remember how patriarchal we still are in the 1700s in Europe, okay, which is when this movement primarily takes place. Is the starts in the very end of the 1600s and then moves all the way through most of the 18th century. And um, this, this movement happens during a time when people are extremely patriarchal. Um, slavery is a commonplace institution in the early 1700s. Um, y you know, there... It, it's not that they're advocating that everybody in society is equal. So that's one. Reason would be another major term that you would want to associate with the Enlightenment. Uh, and then probably happiness would be another one. People were trying to, um, in, the, the Enlightenment philosophers were trying to think about society and, and social changes that would bring about the greatest um, level of, you know, contentment uh, to to society for the greatest number, greatest greatest good for the greatest number. Okay, uh, is is the ideal there? That's kind of a Rousseau idea. Uh, remember that deism is also a function of the Enlightenment movement, where um, they they kind of took on it. Well, it's not. It's not like it's widespread, but they took on new understandings of of um, religion. And so primarily the intellectual movement of the Enlightenment is somewhat conceived in opposition to religion at the time. Um, it's famously a lot of a lot of people mistakenly um, say, oh, you know, this United States is a Christian country. It was founded by Christians and. Da, 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 da. And that's just patently false. It's just not true at all. Thomas Jefferson, Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, all those guys, those founding fathers, not all of them, but a good number of them were deists. And they that meant that they weren't Christian. They believed in this idea of like probably like a God created the world but or the universe, but that pretty much since then, like a watchmaker makes a watch. It's been ticking on its own ever since. 
and that um, and that they believed in in uh, the the reason that here's the thing you have to remember about the founding fathers and just in general enlightenment philosophers because it applies to all of all all students of the of the enlightenment believe that the church fundamentally is a system in society that keeps people from using reason put simply okay if you're a student of the enlightenment generally speaking your opinion on the on the institution of the church and i'm talking particularly the roman catholic church in europe in the 1700s at that time they their their view of it is that the roman catholic church which had been trying to stamp out scientific discovery and and had been questioning heliocentric view and all, and also played a major role in interfering in the daily activities of governance across Europe because most of Europe at this time is absolute monarchies so and and because of the the idea of divine right a lot of rulers believed that their power came directly from God to rule and that's fundamentally opposed to exactly what the whole point of the enlightenment is which is the whole point of the enlightenment is to is to not have somebody or an institution like that thinking for you to not just blindly trust a tyrant or not just blindly trust uh you know a framework of of religious beliefs but instead to question that's the whole idea behind behind education these days question now i would say that that message question everything is sometimes probably in modern day times uh taken to things that don't need to be questioned anymore right like you know the whole thing recently with the covid thing i think unequivocally proves the importance of vaccines in society i just read an article the other day about uh they did a, a, they did a very very intense study on mmr shots measles mumps rubella shots and there's no there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that it that it causes autism or anything like that any of that nonsense that guy already was exposed for making it all up anyway instead people these days question things like you know flat earth we don't need to be questioning whether the earth is flat anymore we figured that one out a couple thousand years ago you know it's there's no there's no reason to question it but the fundamental part of the enlightenment is question everything okay don't just let somebody tell you use reason think about what francis bacon said <clears throat> renounce notions and begin to form an acquaintance with things okay that's such a profound statement in such a few words okay renounce notions and be begin to form an acquaintance with things the idea of like forget what you believe we it, science should never be about what you believe it should be about what the evidence demonstrates you know that's that's the whole point of being a scientific thinker in the first place and these enlightenment philosophers are scientific thinkers they not they may not be phys ph uh, physicists they may not be astronomers they may not be chemists but they are still nonetheless scientific thinkers and i pride myself in thinking very much the same way i'm a sci i may be a history teacher but at the end of the day i'm a scientist you know i think about things from the position of does my argument hold weight because is there evidence to substantiate it you can only go on the basis of your evidence you're collecting evidence for an argument in history the same way that you would collect beaker measurements in a scientific experiment it's the same darn thing so anyhow that's what the enlightenment's all about it's a very important thing in history but i will tell you though that the flaw of the enlightenment of course as a movement is that it results in kind of a cold and mechanistic view of the world and you know there's something to be said about humanity and people being supremely rational all the time if anyone out there is a star trek fan um it's been a while since i watched star trek but star trek um there's a character on star trek the next generation named data okay now as a kid i loved data 
because I think I'm very similar to Data in a way. But Data is not the kind of character in that show that you'd want to go to for, you know, a warm fireside chat, a heart to heart. He's an android, okay? He's kind of like, he's cold, he's calculating, he's supremely rational. Everything that he says, it makes rational sense. He's a rational thinker, okay? But he doesn't, in, in the, what you sacrifice a little bit with all of this reason that they're emphasizing all the time is a little bit of humanness, a little bit of the things that make us, um, the flaws that make us human in the first place. And what I'll say about the, uh, about the situation is that, you know, when it comes to the romantic art movement, which follows the enlightenment art movement of neoclassicism, which is the art style that's associated with the Enlightenment, by the way, just as a little bit of review for you. Neoclassicism is the one to remind you, it's the one that uh, it looks like, you know, all the major buildings in our country, the Capitol building and the White House and the Supreme Court and all that. That's all neoclassical art style, again, heavily influenced by ancient Greece and Rome, just like the, the reason that they were using to justify their understandings of governance and society. Um, so but the art style of romanticism which follows criticized neoclassicism for being too rigid for being too for being too cold for for losing something for losing touch with what makes humans the emotion the emotion of being human and so ro the romantic art movement was supposed to be about a rustic return to nature a little bit return to return to what has made a, what made us human in the first place not just be glorifying these ancient values, ancient Roman values of justice and reason and all of this stuff. So, where does this all begin? Well, it starts with John Locke, probably, is the best place to start. So, John Locke is... <clears throat> Data really be the MVP though. Yeah, he is the MVP. I do like Data. So John Locke, let's talk about. He wrote two treatises on civil government. He's the one who said life, liberty, property, life, liberty, property, not life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That was Thomas Jefferson who stole all of his work from John Locke. Now John Locke's two treatises on government basically says that humans are good. He believed in the idea of tabula rasa. Tabula rasa is blank slate theory, the idea that people learn from their experiences, right? So when we talk about Thomas, or when we talk about John Locke, John Locke believed that the nature of humans is generally good, okay? That, that humans are generally good natured and that, and that because humans are good natured, they have a tendency to look at what they're doing, to look at their mistakes and say, you know, look, hey, you know, th that didn't work out. Let's try it a different way next time. Uh, this isn't working out right now. Let's try something new. And that's kind of where he gets his idea for the right to rebellion. The idea that if government has demonstrated itself not to protect your life, your liberty, or your property, then it's time for a new government. And that's uh, the political basis for the American Revolution in the 1770s. Is that... Uh, the British crown had become tyrannical in its administration of government. Um, <clears throat> now, this, of course, goes into a contradiction with the Christian worldview of this time, which is that humans are naturally evil and greedy and sinful. And because humans are naturally greedy, evil and sinful, the idea is that they needed the church in their lives to bring purity to them. Um, and so this is one way early on in which the um, teachings of John Locke uh, quite early on are, are a totally different conceptualization of, of humans, uh, the perfectibility of humans in particular. Now, toleration is another major theme of the Enlightenment. And one of the reasons that we see toleration as such an important theme of the Enlightenment is because, once again, in their view, any faith based organization is going to be equally reliant on faith and absent of reason. And so, for them, differences in religion should not have uh, kept people from having functioning forms of, of government, uh, 
or practicing those religions so long as they were not harmful to other people in uh, in uh, one's community. So, in other words, if your religion is to go and kill everyone's goats or something like that, obviously that's going to be a religion that's harmful to the rest of the community. But remember that the philosophs were pretty cool with whatever religion that you practice so long as it didn't bring harm to others. And that kind of goes back to, um, you know who came up with that idea? Is um, it's, it's very similar to like a John Stuart Mill f form of liberty. Okay, not all philosophs were equally tolerant of religion, but most of them are pretty good with religious toleration and toleration of things like freedom of speech and things like the censorship, getting rid of censorship. Um, why? Because in their view, a good idea s should rest on its own merit. Um, it, it, it sh good ideas should not be squelched or um, stamped out just because they don't fit in with uh, what the rest of society cur currently thinks about a, par a particular topic, right? Good ideas should be allowed to flourish, and if a good idea is worth itself, then it'll stick around. If a, if a, if a good idea ends up being a not good idea, then it will die out. And the idea here being that freedom of access to information, freedom of speech, and so on, which was not at all a norm, in Europe in this time is something that the Enlightenment philosophers are going to be unafraid of because in in a world where you can only use reason to justify one's uh, political beliefs or economic beliefs or even just social ideas in general, um, you should be able to express those ideas freely without worrying about the criticism that could come come about of it. And this is some of the ideas about that Rousseau had, which is that like. Even if a person has a good idea, perhaps they might in, an, in a certain environment be afraid, too afraid to share it. And then that becomes its own form of oppression, right? Because it's like, even though no one else is doing anything, the mere fact that they believe anything at all about a particular, about a particular idea, let's say uniformly in particular, like in a, in an, in a highly Catholic region, like say, you know, Spain or even some of the uh, Italian states at that time, if you're, in a, if you're in an intensely Catholic region and you come up with an idea that, that questions the infrastructure of the Roman Catholic Church, the infrastructure of the Roman Catholic Church itself becomes an oppressive force because it's the very thing that's preventing a good idea from being able to get out. And so this is all having to do with intellectual philosophy and um, understanding the role that society plays in, in creating its own change. Remember what Rousseau said, Jean-Jacques Rousseau once famously said, man is born free and yet everywhere he is in chains. What does he mean by that? He basically means that, yeah, you're free, but at the same time, there are certain things that restrict and regulate your thought that you're not even aware of. Um, your historical discourse plays a factor in that. There are things today that are considered so beyond radical, you would never even entertain the notion of accepting them as um, realities in your in your world today. Um, and and you know, hey, that's that's fine. It's just something to be aware of because everybody struggles with this, whether they know it or not. So anyhow, uh, moving on, the philosophs were popularizers of the Enlightenment, probably the best known philosoph and most influ influential of the philosophs is going to be Voltaire. And Voltaire was the one that famously said, crush the infamous thing, meaning the structure of the Catholic Church uh, in France at that time, particularly the role that the Catholic Church played in government. And um, he, he just he doesn't like um, the intoleration or the intolerance of uh, religion in Europe at that time. He's a fan of freedom of speech. Uh, and he also, I have to emphasize about uh, Voltaire. Voltaire is an educated and connected man. Remember that Voltaire spends time in the courts of Frederick the Great. He is good friends with Catherine the Great. Uh, he influences Joseph II of Austria. He influenced Napoleon. 
He believes in equality before the law. He believes in um, also, though, he believes in despotism. And that's one of the things that seems on the surface, at least, a little bit counterintuitive. How is it that these guys, on one hand, single handedly uh, inspire the development of democratic Republican style government? OK, yet at the same time, a guy like Voltaire could be so pro despotism. Well, his idea was basically you need structure in society. You need order in society. Remember that Voltaire is coming from a position in history where democratic government doesn't exist anymore and hasn't for thousands of years. You may as well be saying like, you know, that you should bring Socrates back and have him be a teacher or something like that. To him, it seems ludicrous that they would even, again, as a product of his discourse, to introduce a whole new style of governance in a completely, at least across continental Europe, in a completely absolutist environment is insane. He would never do that. So, uh, so what does he suggest? He suggests if you can get a an enlightened despot who who knows who is himself or herself a student of the Enlightenment, who believes in the principles of the Enlightenment, who believes in using reason who believes in religious toleration. That's how you're going to get the changes is from the top down. He believes in despotism, but he believes in enlightened despotism. Okay, and those three enlightened despots, once again, that he was friends with, Frederick II of Prussia, Frederick the Great, Catherine II of Russia, Catherine the Great, and then Joseph II of Austria. And those three enlightened despots, uh, take on the teachings of Voltaire and to the extent that they're able at least or willing uh, implement some but not all of those ideas certainly in Russia for example they do not implement freedom of speech or religion for that matter um, Russia being more conservative Prussia as well remember that Joseph II ended up being the most uh, reform minded of all of the enlightened despots but a lot of his reforms get kind of thrown out afterwards then you got montesquieu montesquieu if you remember was the guy who believed in the separation of powers so have different branches of government legislative judicial and executive branch of government and each of these branches have checks and pal uh, balances against one another so separation of powers montesquieu skewer if you remember the little drawings that i did the skewer checks and balances uh like of shish kebab all right Jean-Jacques Rousseau, here's an idea to remember about the uh, enlightened philosophers, the idea of social contracts. Social contracts um, manifest in different ways. If you're talking about a Hobbes version of the social contract, that social contract is going to look different than the social contract that, say, Rousseau came up with or the social contract that uh, John Locke believes in. So, so you got to be careful about that word social contract because it's not a one meaning phrase. It depends on whose contract we're talking about. If we're talking about Rousseau's contract, his version of the social contract basically says that the social contract is that people in society generally, generally will be willing to give up certain freedoms or individual privileges in order for the rest of society to function better. Greatest good for the greatest number. In other words, think about this, this COVID thing that's been going on lately. For the most part, people have been pretty obedient about the idea until this last week here where now people are getting a little bit feisty. But until this last week here, for the last nearly two months now, people have been largely pretty obedient about looking out for one another while at the same time giving up their interests. And this is exactly something that Jean-Jacques Rousseau would have said would have happened. Jean-Jacques Rousseau would say that people in, the, in a situation like this where there's people who are at danger of becoming ill or dying from COVID, okay, that other people will willfully give up some of their privileges not only for self-protection but also for the betterment of society and we have to be honest at least here in california in particular we've been pretty good about staying at home the COVID rates despite having some of the highest populations 
uh, concentrations in the country uh, have remained relatively low comparative to, say, like a place like New York or something like that. And we also put into place these social measures that are restrictive on people's individual liberties, excuse me, restrictive on people's individual liberties pretty early on. <clears throat> now, no one likes being restricted. You know, I don't like having to stay at home or, uh, you know, only go out for essential goods. But because I'm a student of the Enlightenment, I'm willing to sacrifice some of my own personal freedoms and dignities in order to uh, look out for the betterment of society. And that's exactly the sort of thing that Jean-Jacques Rousseau would have said would happen. So, um, or should should happen. Okay, so that's the social, social contract. Um, you can't put too much emphasis on property. It has to be more about people, according to uh, Rousseau. Um, some people also say of Rousseau that he's kind of the um, gateway figure between the Enlightenment and the Romantic period. You have to understand that Rousseau's writings are at times really contradictory of one another and at times a little bit complex. So he seems a little bit to, um, to like double cross himself a little bit. But basically, uh, he says that the state of man is that they are a noble savage, but we get corrupted by the materialism of civilization. That's another interesting thing about Rousseau is he says that people left untouched tend to look out for one another better than people touched by the blessings of civilization. Uh, so what he says is that people are corrupted by the nature of materialism. They're corrupted by the nature of greed or profit or power. Uh, and, and that in some sense, when a person becomes an enlightened thinker, the enlightenment movement itself has a tendency to corrupt the goodness in them, which is another pretty incredible thing. This is a guy who you could tell was really thinking. Rousseau's writings are very, very uh, fascinating, so that's why we talk about them. All right, Dennis Diderot is another major uh, figure of the enlightenment. He's the one who popularized the massive compendium of information known as the encyclopedia. You probably recall that. Marquis de Beccaria or Beccaria. Um, Beccaria, I think it's Beccaria, um, on crimes and punishment. He was the uh, Enlightenment philosopher that said that there should be no unusual punishments for crimes, cruel or un unusual punishment. Um, ends up getting itself into the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. A right to a fair trial and due process are also in there. Um, a right to a speedy trial, rather, and, and due process and habeas corpus and all that. And those are all fundamental ideas of the Enlightenment and political philosophy as well that are emerging at this time. But a big one is no cruel or unusual punishments. In other words, um, you know, judges can't just administer weird punishments where, like, you have to go and, you know, put your head in the stockade for two weeks in the middle of town square where people can slap you and stuff like that. Those kinds of punishments don't exist anymore. Although, you know, um, I wouldn't want to go to jail. Seems like a pretty cruel life to me, but I don't know. Uh, his ideas influenced enlightened despots. Uh, Frederick the Great banned torture. Catherine the Great restricted it. Joseph II banned torture and the death penalty. Adam Smith is another major figure. He's not really a philosopher. But he is an important figure in the scheme of the Enlightenment because he advocates for Enlightenment on the grounds of the economy. So when we talk about economic freedom, okay, the idea of wealth of nations, capitalism as a function of the global capitalist economy or market economy that's developing during this time, where you have European nations who have developed colonies around the globe. They're growing stuff on those colonies. We're seeing international trade. Uh, people are buying goods from further and further and further distant regions, um, particularly foodstuffs and, and other things like that, like tobacco and coffee and um, cocoa and sugar and all that sort of stuff. Uh, is grown a long distance away from where these Europeans are and uh, end up consuming it. Tea would be another one. And um, coffee houses, in fact, played a role in the Enlightenment, if you recall. They're, they they had kind of a falling out afterwards, but coffee houses were places where people could go for a while, drink coffee, talk about um, political public issues, and then um, 
and then you know go about their daily business so it kind of the coffee house kind of democratizes uh the enlightenment because it allows people to come in and exchange ideas freely now uh, that's in britain mostly uh coffee houses in france were known as salons uh salons were underground though because in france due to the absolutist government of the time um trying to squelch anti-church anti-clerical messages and stuff like that the government of france being absolutist was in cahoots with the church in france at the time which would try to squash enlightenment ideas so they had to meet underground in these things called salons uh, which would be hosted a lot of times by women marie therese jeffrin being a very uh, well-known one uh, who was friends with Dennis Diderot, if I remember right. And so, you know, she hosted one of the better known salons, but it also gave, um, you know, an interesting place for women in those opportunities as well. Now, coffee houses, primarily, primarily men congregating in those. Um, but uh, to get back to the global economy and talking about Adam Smith, three fundamental ideas come out of Adam Smith's uh, wealth of nations, which is oftentimes considered like the the Bible of, of modern capitalism, uh, law of self-interest, the idea that people are individual actors in the marketplace who operate in their own self-rational best interest, which is true sometimes, but there have been arguments to be made against that in recent years, like in the case of monopolies and stuff like that. Speaking of which, Adam Smith would have been strictly against monopolies. But anyway, um, so law of self-interest, law of competition is another major feature of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Law of competition says that in a free market where the invisible hand uh, runs things, people are going to compete with one another to make the best goods for the cheapest price because that's what they that they want to make money on that good. Plus, they want to stay in business and they're self-interested in their business in pursuits. And so they're going to compete with one another. And then finally... Uh, law of, of supply and demand, which basically says that if you allow the market to be free, the market will regulate itself. You don't need a government to come in and say, you need to make X amount of this or you need to make Y amount of that because somebody out there will start making it. Now, of course, there have been challenges to that as well, because if you allow a totally free market to, to develop, what will happen is companies which are profit motivated and not consumer motivated or like consumer safety motivated will end up doing things to cut corners that could end up having a dramatically bad effect on the economy like stuff involving dumping toxic waste in rivers for example right like companies are looking to save money they're not going to dispose of things responsibly if they can just throw it out and not get in trouble for it so government regulation ended up being one of these things that ended uh, that that came into um into the into the economy starting in the turn of the 20th century because people were getting meat that had like broken off knife blades in it and stuff like that and the government realized like hey the government ostensibly is here to protect the people and you can't just let businesses do whatever they want because businesses don't care if people are protected or not so anyway um so that kind of gives you an idea of Adam Smith's Law of Nations, or excuse me, Wealth of Nations. Um, Madame de Stel was another uh, woman who hosted these discussions, Madame de Stel, S-T-A-E-L. Um, and she brought also German Romantic ideas to France. Mary Wollstonecraft was a, an English or British uh, woman who promoted that uh, the vindication of the rights of women. She believed that women should have just as much opportunity to participate in the Enlightenment as men. Um, there are some other famous uh, late Enlightenment thinkers. Paul de Holbach would be one. He was a staunch atheist. David Hume was another who was a skeptic um, and kind of definitely argues like desire governs human behavior more than reason does. And he ar argues against faith in both natural law and religion. He basically says that it's desire that dictates people's uh, views first. Uh, and then Nicholas de Condorcet, who, uh, or de Condorcet, uh, Progress of the Human Mind, his utopian ideas also undermine the legit legitimacy of Enlightenment ideals. So as the Enlightenment goes on, you get to Condorcet, you get to Hol de Holbach, and you get to Hume. Those guys are going to tend to be a little bit more radical in their views and probably a little bit more anti-clerical as well. 
Uh, and then Immanuel Kant, who was probably the best known of the German philosophers or philosophs. Um, and he separated the science, uh, separated science and morality into two separate branches of knowledge. Uh, and he argued that science could describe nature, but not provide an understanding of morality behind it. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's another aspect of this, which is like, where does morality fit into the scheme of the enlightenment? Okay. So classical liberalism, um, is kind of this political outgrowth of the Enlightenment. When we talk about classical liberalism, I need you to divorce yourself from any ideas of what you think that word means today. Again, remember that liberalism, as we've talked about in class many, many, many times, is just the idea of being free. And liberals in this in society in this time are going to be more progressive um, in their viewpoint. Um, but it's actually odd because now the liberal kind of views that they have of the enlightenment would actually much be much more be um uh something that a person of modern day conservative ideals probably subscribes to uh when we talk about liberal neoliberalism as a as a function of the economy that's the idea that the economy should be freed up that big business should be allowed to reign and so on and so forth so when we talk about modern day liberalism okay it's kind of um, it's kind of a misnomer because you know classical liberalism is up, is about freeing the marketplace. It's about that Adam Smith free market capitalistic economics viewpoint, and and we all benefit uh, to one degree or another, especially here in Southern California, from that um, from that from that economic system, um, but. But um, it's just that politically, the ideas of, um, you know, or social ideas of modern day conservatives tend to be more defensive of things like the church and stuff like that. So you really have to, you have to, when you're using that word liberalism, you really have to distinguish if you're talking about economics or like social um, views. Because if we're talking about economics, most modern day self reported conservatives would probably have pretty classical liberal ideas about the economy, if that makes any sense at all. Hopefully it does. Um, so the impact of Locke and Montesquieu was very visible, especially in the U.S. Constitution. And the U.S. Constitution is being drafted about two years before the start of the French Revolution. So uh, when the French Revolution starts, it's um, it definitely embraces some of those same ideas. OK, um, impact of the Enlightenment on society. Basically, it's the first time we see the emergence of a secular, non-religious worldview that accompanies the scientific revolution. Um, we see the emergence of enlightened despotism under Catherine the Great of Russia, Peter, or excuse me, um, Frederick the Great of Prussia, <clears throat> Joseph II of Austria. And then if you want to include Napoleon Bonaparte, actually, he would be a very good example of an enlightened despot as well. Um, American French revolutions were heavily influenced by classical liberalism and the ideas of Adam Smith, but also the ideas of John Locke and the idea that, that government should be there to protect life, liberty, and property. Remember that Republican-style government is considered extremely radical, uh, at this time that it is not commonplace so that when they try to implement uh, Republican government in France under, under Montesquieu, uh, it's, it's really, really, really violent. And it's not very, uh, it's the time, it's literally known as the reign of terror. It's the time, we'll talk about that when we review French Revolution in another couple um, distance lessons here. But, uh, but that's, a, that's another one. And so, okay. Let's see here, moving down. It's all enlightened despots. Okay. So, um, and then the growth of laissez-faire, free market. Okay, uh, the idea of government should keep its hands off the economy. Laissez-faire, let do, let the economy do. Let the uh, supply and demand dictate the, the free market. And um, that was, um, that was, huge during the industrial revolution the, which is which is immediately of course what follows um the french revolution and the american revolutions shortly thereafter we see the emergence of the uh 
uh, Industrial Revolution, which which grew, uh, you know, it proliferated greatly due to the spirit of um, liberal classical liberalism and laissez-faire economics during that time. Okay. Uh, that was uh, just shy of an hour, and so I will leave it off there, and there is going to be a brand new review uh, assignment that I will put up in probably the next hour here or so um, pertaining to the Enlightenment. So let me jump back over here and see if there's any questions. Yeah, Colorado already. Yeah, I know it. Um, we will see. Hopefully this the hopefully it's hopefully we're ready. You know, that's all I can say. I read an article that Singapore. Um, Singapore had people go back to work and stuff, and then right away the the um, virus started jumping back again. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with it. I hope that. Uh, I hope we can return back to normal. I mean, the economy is really struggling right now. So obviously, uh, obviously that would be good to get back to work. But, but boy, I don't know. Um, this has been something else. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. All right. Well then. Folks, I have... Um, Renee, you don't have to retract your messages. You can you can ask whatever you want. I'm not I'm not worried about it. All right. Um, so, any questions pertaining to enlightenment or anything that I can handle on the God? It's already getting hot, boy. I'll tell you what, it is getting hot. I might have to turn on the air today. The weather is warming up big time. Plus, I'm sitting in a studio in my house with a bunch of synthesizer equipment it's, all of it r generates heat so it's hot in here anyhow if there's no questions folks i'll leave it there as always feel free to reach out to me on uh on schoology just wait a minute make sure that no one else missed any messages All right. Well, folks, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll make sure to. Yep. Thanks, Din Din. You have a good one, too. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I'll make sure to get the live uh, or the um, co uh, the what you call it, the uh, distance lessons instructions all set up for you by about noon today. I got to give a lecture to uh world history right now we're going to continue we're going to be talking about the holocaust a little bit today so um anyhow folks thank you so much take care